Stories influence, teach, and inspire us. But what about the storytellers who create them? Uncorking a Story profiles storytellers to uncover how their background and life experiences influence the stories they create. We learn what motivates them, their path to success, and what fuels them to keep creating. It all starts by asking one simple question. Where does your story begin? Welcome to Uncorking a Story. Now here's your host, Mike Carlin. Well, hello and welcome to Uncorking a Story. I'm your host, Mike Carlin. And today I'm excited to introduce you to Johnny Serpilla. As founder and CEO of Encourage LLC, Johnny specializes in leadership development. Every year, he addresses organizations with his message of the importance of managing and reframing thoughts, modeling healthy thinking, and searching for positive meaning, developing meaningful professional and personal relationships that genuinely reflect the personal brand of the individual and organization, create synergies that drive growth for all stakeholders. He joins me today to discuss his career and his latest book, Life is Hard, But I'll Be Okay, The Power of Hope, Emerging Through Pain and Learning to Live with Gratitude. Welcome to Uncorking the Story, Johnny. Thank you, Mike. Thanks for having me. Well, Johnny, I'm going to ask you the same question I ask everybody as we begin, which is, uh, Johnny, where does your story begin? You know, Mike, my story begins um, really with a blessed background of committed parents uh, that love me, uh, looked out for me, were strict with me, instilled values of uh, right and wrong and morals and hard work ethic. So I was one of the lucky ones that, you know, got that start in life. Um, What I found is that it really prepared me for the challenges that were headed ahead in life for me, what was coming, what, you know, I thought that this kind of charmed background of, you know, you work hard, you achieve a goal, and it just, you keep going up, that it um, was always going to be that way. And, And it was that way until it wasn't. And so, you know, for me, you know, my background um, is one that is high in sensitivity. Um, I'm full-blooded Italian. Um, you know, we, we love to feel and talk and share. And um, it, it, that became very helpful to me as tragedy hit our lives and uh, life got really, really hard. And so I'm a guy with anxiety. I'm a guy that worries about uh, just about everything and everybody. Uh, and I'll tell you, at the end of the day, I don't know if I wish I would change that or could change it. Um, I deal with it, but I don't know if I want it to be completely gone because it helps me make good decisions because I'm always thinking four to five chess moves out. And as I wrote in my book, Life is Hard, But I'll Be Okay, it helped me really balance as hard as it was for me and for my wife to balance the thoughts that I was having and find ways to turn it to gratitude and something good because I couldn't live with the intensity of the negativity. Yeah. And so I kind of attribute my anxiety to that, that it really pushed me to get out of a dark place. Right. It's almost a way of reframing that energy, that, that anxious energy you have to, to, to something more positive. That's right. And I'm all about reframing thoughts. Uh, we spend a lot of time in therapy um, and, and a business partner today is Dr. Barbara Fordyce, who 30 years ago started seeing my wife and me as things got tough for us. And we just developed a strong friendship and business relationship. And she taught cognitive behavioral therapies that would show us through the challenges that we were living through, how to reframe a thought and still have your original thoughts, still understand it and where it came from but then turn it to something good. And so many times we're stuck with thoughts that cause us to self-medicate and to self-harm. And as dark of a place that we were, I needed to get out of that space, wanted to get out of that space. And she gave me the tools to do it. Right. How comfortable do you feel going into the backstory there in terms of the, the challenges you were facing with your, with your wife and your life at the time? I'm very comfortable with it. Um, number one, I wrote about it, uh, but you know, number two, um, I think for me, and and I just learned so much from other people that, you know, the question has been asked, you know, who's your authentic self? And Mike, I have no idea who that guy is. Um, <laughs> he is lost and buried long time ago uh, because I've just been inspired by people that I've loved and respected. And I've had the privilege of watching them 
through difficult situations and even watching them through joyful situations and see energies and, and styles and, and their leadership and their humanity that I wanted to bring into myself. And so, you know, my authentic self is just a compilation of all the great people, the men and women that I have just honored and had in my life. And so uh, with that, I like paying that forward and putting that out there with me. So there's no question that you have that's off limits, uh, certainly, and, and I'm an open book. Yeah. Well, you know, it's interesting. Um, you know, you, you kind of started off by talking about sort of like an uh, almost idea like life, you know, good family system growing up, good values, you know, hard work. And, you know, some people might be scratching their head and say, you know, what does this guy have to be anxious about? Um, you know, he, he had a great foundation that it's not a lot for a therapist to work with. But I think it just goes to show that, you know, anxiety doesn't discriminate. You know, it, it doesn't, um, you know, any of these sort of what I what I sometimes they're called invisible disabilities, but they they really don't discriminate based on your background, based on your family system. You know, people come from great households, you know, also have these, you know, inner, I hate to call them inner demons, but that's kind of what they are sometimes because you just kind of want to get them out. Um, when did you when did you first start feeling anxious or, or or feelings of anxiety? You know, I've really um, I think I've always felt them, um, and I think you're exactly right with the word choice. Our inner demons, we all have them. I think insecurity is the source of all workplace conflict. Um, kind of when I do leadership talks, I talk a lot about that. Um, but then insecurities within ourselves, and I think you know I've always questioned because I'm a very active thinker. I have which a lot of anxious people are, right? Active thinker was my kind term that I gave to myself before a diagnosis. Um, and I love the stage that we're at right now in our culture of talking about mental health issues. Um, you know, I had a grandfather suffer from depression. Um, I watched him suffer my whole life and I didn't understand it until I started to have some thoughts and I could see how they gripped him and how potentially genetically it was, you know, tied to me as well. Um, but, you know, I think I always felt it as a kid because I worried about things. I thought about things. I had a sensitivity that maybe some boys don't have or some men still don't have. Um, and again, I don't know if that's my Italian background or uh, if it's just a bloodline in me or if it's, you know, just part of my thought process. But I've always felt it. Um, it it's manifested through medical illnesses, um, th through my stress channels to my stomach. So I had my first upper and lower GI series when I was five years old. So it's really always been in there in me. And, you know, surgeries as a child, um, in and out of doctor's offices, constantly dealing with stomach issues and uncontrolled vomiting. And, you know, all of those things, I think, was really just due to stress. Yeah. Yeah, it's some, some kind of pain body inside you, um, to, to, to use the Eckhart, you know, Tolle term. That's right. Um, and, and I want to say that you, I, I like the way that you phrased it, that from an onlooker from the outside, I shouldn't have that because I might not have had the typical stressors that other people have and people that I have great respect for. So when I hear somebody that has a story like my dad, you know, immigrants that come here with nothing and build my dad built a very successful business went to machine shop for high school so didn't have a conventional high school experience of course did not go to college and he built a sizable business that i was blessed to take over and run and then eventually sell and then played a, a large executive seat in the multi-billion company dollar company that bought us you know i have huge respect for guys like my dad and uh that that really had a lot to complain about I didn't have a lot to complain about, but I had feelings that I had to deal with. Yeah. So, so then they're, they're real, right? They're, whether others can, can look at it, and I didn't need their validation for how I felt uh, or what I thought. I knew, knew what I was feeling, and I knew what I had to deal with. Yeah, and that's the, the tricky thing, too, is, and, and I mean, I can't speak for your dad, I could, but I can speak for my own, you know, uh, my own life. You, when you have feelings like that, and I was very sensitive, still I'm very sensitive as well. Um, you know, I always felt kind of unseen as a kid. Um, you know, I had, I came from a great family like you, um, parents, you know, worked hard, dad worked very hard, good, um, you know, we, Italian, Irish, you know, Catholics, <laughs> you know, and um, my brother that I have a twin brother and he, um, you know, he was, he was sickly. Um, <laughs> he's fine now, kind of. 
But, um, <laughs> you know, I always like to say that, you know, Jimmy, Jimmy took all the attention, you know, and if and I and I had to be the easy one. So in, in that sort of structure, if I was ever upset about something, you know, and if I ever rocked the boat a little bit, like it didn't it didn't always go over very well. Um, so I felt like I couldn't rock the boat and I had to avoid anything that that reeked of conflict. And, and I only discovered this about myself recently. I went on this um, intensive five day men's thing in California and, um, you know, I learned all these things about myself. I'm like, shit, that that's that's where that came from. That, 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 that's where these feelings come from. Um, so, yeah, I mean, th- these these things, you know, we all grow up um, in. in in many ways, in imperfect circumstances, right? Because we're being raised by people who are imperfect because they're human beings, you know, <laughs> they, they do the best exactly. they can. But later in life, you know, these things creep up and and unless you can identify them and, and learn how to repair them, um, like these same patterns are, are just going to keep repeating themselves in our lives. That's right. You know, I, I think about how intensely that Susan and I have parented the three kids that we were blessed with. And, and we can certainly talk about that challenge to get there. Yeah. And, and I look at um, some challenges my daughter has uh, fighting perfectionism. And that's something for me that um, I, I play a hand in my daughter's battle today because as somebody that was very intense and focused and um, raised by a perfectionist mother, um, perfectionism in my childhood growing up was uh, applauded. It was a great thing to accomplish and have that desire and, and that intensity. And so we passed that on to Bella. And as she had those natural tendencies as a little girl of wanting things a certain way as a three-year-old, you know, we celebrated that and thought it was so awesome. And oh, our Bella's a, a perfectionist. Well, again, you know, we added into those stresses that she was feeling to never get a B in her life and even graduate college with a four point in biology and a pre-med major. And, you know, all these things that we thought were validating and, and helping her until, you know, she finds herself um, as an adult at 24, really battling issues of perfectionism that is inhibiting her life. And I'm, a super committed dad. It was the greatest honor in my life to be a dad and a husband. And my hand, my signature is all over that. My fingerprints are all over Bella's challenges because I reinforced it in a loving way. But again, it kind of gave her like you feeling like she couldn't make mistakes. And, yeah. and so, you know, as, and I, and I think I'll add this as well. I realized that I had anxiety through parenting Bella, seeing and hearing the thoughts that she had as a little girl, that my wife would say, oh my gosh, who thinks like that? And I'd say, I do. Hi there. I think that's completely <laughs> normal thought. Um, and, uh, and, and, and my kids are like you, they're the Italian Irish Catholic kids, because um, I, I married an O'Brien. And, uh, and so, you know, Susan couldn't identify with those thoughts. And it, then it started the conversation that my thoughts were not maybe normal. Uh, yeah. Because Susan thought Bella's thoughts were not normal. And I thought they were right on. Um, I thought she was, you know, hitting the, the target perfectly. So, you know, our kids teach us a lot. And, and now, you know, with my kids at 22, 24, and 26, I think I'm qualified to be a parent. I think yeah, if we could do it over, I'm ready <laughs> now, Mike. I, I could do it. I well, can do it well now. I tell you, we had all of our kids at once. We have triplets. Um, and they, uh, they turned 20 in April. So, you know, we didn't I we didn't have the benefit of learning, you know, from the first and, and, and maybe applying that to the second. Like we screwed them all up at the same time, you know, um, but we have, you know, one of my daughters. So we have two girls and a boy and my daughter, Maggie, who was um, an ice hockey player. She uh, she had that perfectionist thinking, too. Like if she had a bad game, if the puck got by her, you know, when she was playing defense or, you know, if somebody scored on her because, you know, she she missed she messed up. a play, She would be so in her head and upset um like for the rest of the, it would like ruin the weekend and i'm like you know I, I don't come from that sort of same thinking but i'm like maggie it's okay like you just learn from that experience and you know do better next time and and that was the wrong thing to say and she also is like a 4.0 student at you know the university of connecticut right now so but um you know i, I don't want to make this about me i was just thinking about that when you were That's talking awesome. about i Bella. love i love hearing that <laughs> i love hearing that and 
and we're the same there. And I'll tell you, Mike, it, it kind of maybe leads into a good segue here because we're connected in a lot of ways um, because what my book is about is uh, the birth of our triplets. And uh, we had triplets um, that passed away 27 years ago. Oh, so, see now this is this is this is uh, I did not um, I did not know this, um, and I so I I really didn't. I don't I don't remember that in in my pre reads for uh, for this interview. But um, please tell me tell me more about that. Yeah, so that's why life is hard, right? Yeah. And uh, so through our in 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 my book chronicles our journey to build a family, and and so it talks about really the perfect start that we had and careers going great and all those things, and then. Um, the infertility uh, that was upon us suddenly. And after years um, of treatment, we did end up having triplets. We had two sons and a daughter, mm -hmm. uh, Nicholas, Mary, and Peter. And uh, they passed away um, uh, the evening that they were born uh, due to prematurity. And, and so, as you know, in a triplet pregnancy, you know, your biggest challenge is, you know, premature birth. And, yeah. um, and, and that got us and, and got our kids. And, and so it was from that experience, um, from their death, um, after the funeral, um, you know, processing and trying to put our lives back together and going from a family of five back down to the two of us and then back to our infertil infertility journey and then, you know, future pregnancies that didn't work out and adoptions internationally and domestically and then dangerous other pregnancies is how we built our, our family. And there's 13 different children that came in and out of our lives um, for us to have the three that we have. So my son Stone is, uh, we call him lucky baby number 13. And so that's what the book chronicles. It's really a memoir of those years. And in reflection, um, I love the blessing that you have of 20 year old triplets and raising them. And that was literally a, a dream that we had um, this is the first time I've, I've done so many podcasts and this is the first i've been able to talk to somebody that is the father of triplets also yeah. and and so i get really happy when i hear stories like yours where it worked out and uh you, you've raised those kids and and for a long time i was in a place where i just wanted nicholas mary and peter to live to be one or two or five and, and think of, or 20, I mean, thinking of, you know, all that we missed out on and through reframing thoughts and, and learning to live with gratitude, as I talk about in the subtitle of my book, you know, my wife and I both got to a place that we're just incredibly thankful for the day that we had. Yeah. And, and we learned to find that as, as awful as their death was and, and watching them each take their last breaths and pass, there was a lot of beauty in that time and it, and it framed and changed us, um, certainly changed me as a man, as the father I wanna be, as the husband I wanna be. And um, a lot of blessings came from their, their brief lives. And so the thought has been reframed from, it's not a tragic event, um, but it's really a blessed event and um, that we've really come to see it that way. Yeah, I mean, just so much to unpack there. But, um, you know, I'll, I'll just share. Uh, my wife was put on bed rest at 24 weeks um, and, and then bed rest in the hospital um, at 25. You know, they gave her a week at home and then they said, no, you got it. Too many, too many contractions. Um, and then they were born at 31 weeks. So they were born, you know, two months, a little over two months early. And uh, I mean, it was touch and go in the NICU. It was not um, right. You know, I remember when they came out, I'm like, I, you know, I hate, I don't make, don't mean to sound this like a joke, make this sound like a joke, but you know, they, I, they showed me my daughter, Grace, and I'm like, that does not look like a baby. You know, it doesn't, it, you know, she, she did not look like a human being. Um, thankfully, I mean, we are so blessed that, that our doctor was so aggressive with my, with my wife's prenatal treatment, you know, they were pumping her up with all sorts of stuff and, um, there was a couple of rounds of steroids they gave for the kids' lung development, um, which and now you know they're they're on the charts and all that good stuff. But um, I imagine the the because I know the the stress that raising raising our kids, um, you know, we went from zero babies to three babies in the span of three minutes, and we didn't know what we're doing. I mean, I was all of twenty seven years old when when this happened. Um, 
and it led to a lot of a lot of stress. But I, I imagine this um, the stress and grief that you and your wife were experiencing at the time. Um, it, it, I think it's amazing that that your marriage made it because I, I know. I know that that's that's a stress that I don't think anyone can or a grief that that anyone can really fathom. You know, we we knew the statistic of uh, the divorce rate of co couples that lose a child. We also knew the statistic of the divorce rate of couples going through infertility and how many never conceive because they don't stay married because it's so stressful. You know, that's one of the blessings that came from Nicholas, Mary and Peter is that seeing all that my wife endured, um, seeing what she went through and the pain that she felt and the pain that I felt, we were so connected that day that cemented our relationship. We had a great relationship anyway. Um, but really, Mike, after that, what are we going to argue about? I mean, yeah. when you see somebody that you love so destroyed and she saw that in me and I saw that in her and the days that we couldn't get out of bed and the days that we would, you know, promise that we're going to stop going to the cemetery every day because it wasn't healthy. And then I'd show up and she was already there. Um, and we kind of, you know, we're breaking each other's uh, promises to each other. You know, from there, that's one of the blessings that came out of that is that, you know, from that point forward, not that I didn't have this commitment before, but the intensity was just so much higher. There's nothing I'm going to do that is going to knowingly hurt my wife. Um, I, I'm just... I, I can't, I'm, I'm not going to. And so we were fortunate that we grieved towards each other as opposed to away from each other. Um, that took a conscious effort. We were in therapy that helped us greatly. Um, we got some great advice from a couple that came over the night before the funeral um, that we didn't even know very well um, and showed unannounced up at our doorstep to tell us about their baby that died 20 years previously. And how you need to start grieving immediately together. And so that's one of the blessings that came out of it. And, um, and I'm thankful to Nicholas, Mary and Peter for, and I'm thankful for God for blessing them in our lives and for having their lives have such significance. The, the book goes on to talk about other things, even internationally in some failed adoptions on the ways that because of their birth, um, that lives were changed around the world uh, for the better. And, um, and I'll save that for the, the reader for the book because yeah. it, it's so unbelievable the things that happened um, that in the glory for God that came out of that experience um, in so many ways. You know, and then of course the kind of shocking pregnancies that followed um, and an adoption. And I say, I don't remember, I have an adopted kid. I don't remember which one is. Uh, but, you know, I got a file that proves uh, that one of them is adopted. Um, but, you know, through all of that, the appreciation that we had, and then we too had other preemies, um, but uh, at 34 weeks, um, and, and Bella, her middle name is Grace, so our daughter is Bella Grace. So again, our, our connections uh, continue. Oh, um, yeah. So uh, anyway, it's, um, it's reframing those thoughts. That's what it's all about. Yeah. I mean, what, what, when did you start writing this book? I started when our son stone left for college, uh, four years ago, uh, and we became empty nesters. And so, uh, as I mentioned, Bella, uh, Bo is 26, Bella's 24 and stone is 22. And so we had, you know, three kids then in less than four years, and then they were kind of quickly off to college. And that empty nest was, something that we dreaded. Uh, we absolutely hated the thought of that. And we talked about it when we were pregnant with Nicholas, Mary and Peter that, you know, they're all going to leave at once. We've got to have more kids after this. We, we couldn't handle that. And um, so four years ago, I started when uh, Stone went off to college and all kids picked the same college in North Carolina, High Point University, an amazing uh, premier life skills university. And, and they all live now in Chicago. Um, and so they kind of travel in little packs. Uh, but I started writing it and then it, it got really tough. Writing it was hard. Um, you know, I had processed all the emotions and dealt with it over the years. And we celebrate Nicholas, Mary and Peter's birthday every year, wherever we are, when we're all together, we have two blue and one pink balloon that we send up. And um, now that, you know, the kids are grown and we're in different places, we're all FaceTiming and wherever everyone is on February 22nd, and we're keeping our tradition going to honor them. 
but it got pretty hard and I took a break for a little while, um, almost two years. And then uh, we spent our winters down in Naples, Florida. And so last October, when I got down there, um, my kids were challenging me, dad, you started this, you got to finish it. And, you know, let's, let's do this. You want to honor mom, you want to honor Nicholas, Mary and Peter, get this done. And so the tables turned and my kids started challenging me. And uh, I wrote the last 17 chapters over about a four month period. And ironically, this year on February 22nd, Nicholas, Mary and Peter's 27th birthday um, is the day that I finished the book. Wow. Was that coincidentally? I was going to say coincidentally, or was that by design? But no, it was just um, I'm just painfully aware of their birthday every year, and we had our balloons to to do the FaceTime around the country with the kids to get it all together. And even this year is pretty cool. Stone was a senior in college, and behind him were probably 20 of his fraternity brothers and best friends um, for the balloon send off. And you know, it just was so great to see again how Nicholas, Mary, and Peter's lives touched even his buddies that were there with their best friend uh, stone to honor his older brothers and sister on their birthday and they all wanted to be part of the send-off and it was just a pretty cool thing yeah it's a, t a like a total ripple effect yeah you know? it is and and you know just is a great opportunity to kind of glorify god and in, in the good that happened and it's it's just we always want more of something but you know one day um, can be a glorious day and a blessing that we can just sit in gratitude and not hope for more. Yeah. Yeah. That's, uh, you know, as, as I hear you talk, um, you know, I can tell you, you've got a strong faith. Um, but I can imagine given all the things that you and your family went through like that, that some people might just turn, turn around and say, you know what, how could, how could God do this to me? Now, how could, um, you know, there, there's, it's almost like proving the non-existence of God with, with, you know, so much of that, um, so many challenges and, and curveballs um, thrown at you, but it seems like you, you know, you really didn't go down that path, did you? We did not. And matter of fact, one of the chapters in the book is entitled, Why Not Us? And, and that really came from how many times people would say to us, whether it was, at the funeral, after the funeral, um, over the years, um, because as other awful things happened um, that are chronicled in the book, I always said, no, no, no. I Because the, they said, why are you, I'm sure you say, why me? And it was, no, not at all. Why not me? I mean, look in this world, awful things are happening every day to innocent people, good people. You know, there's books written, why do bad things happen to good people, right? And so, I know that I'm not exempt from that. My wife knows that she's not exempt from that. So we were blessed to start our therapy, if you will, a step ahead of that, because mm -hmm. we didn't need to spend any time on why me. It, it's clear why me, because bad things happen to good people. It just, yeah. it's out there in the world. And then it further proved that the great existence of God, um, and for us, you know, because the time that they were alive, we were the happiest people in that hospital. Um, we knew the outcome that was coming, but we were carried. That's why one of the uh, chapters in the book is Footprints in the Sand, uh, yeah. that poem. You know, we were carried through that time that, Mike, we were literally the happiest people in that hospital and, um, and what we experienced. And, and then when you see the goodness and kindness that was just poured on us from so many people that, you know, God was stirring in their hearts to go above and beyond, it, it made us realize um, you know, what we're called to do to serve others. And, and so again, you know, we, we landed in gratitude for those people, um, for their gestures, for their kindness, their love, their support, um, because it was seven years of a lot of support that we got, um, through this journey. Yeah. And now you're paying it forward with, uh, with this book. That's right. I mean, the book is, um, really written, uh, first and foremost, I wanted to honor my wife. I wanted people to, to know um, what Susan did emotionally and physically, the drugs that she endured um, that I would inject into her that I felt awful about. The first Pergonol shot I gave her, um, I cried as I injected her because it just, in my core, I felt like I was doing something that could harm her later. In her early 40s, she needed a double mastectomy and 
Um, I under, I, I just, I always worried about that. My anxiety was going there. And so then of course, when a mass showed up on a mammogram, you know, my, my mind goes to the worst place and we had a problem. And I thought I saw this problem coming. Um, of, of course, that's never been scientifically proven. It was just felt within me that I didn't feel good about um, all that her body was enduring um, to become a mom. And then I wanted to write the book for all those who find life to be hard. And I think we all really do. In, in raising your triplets, there's a lot of hard times in there. Um, when they go off to college, it's going to be super hard, right? Oh, man, and I, I don't like it. I'm telling you, we have, um, they're going into their junior year now. And it's just way too friggin' quiet in my house. You know, I always sit, you know, after dinner, my wife and I will watch little tv and i'm like it is just too quiet in here like there's no friends making noise there's no like arguing you know which which you don't think you'd miss but you know now they're home for the summer but you know, they're leaving in a couple of weeks and i'm like uh, it's just it's silence too, is definitely quiet it's too yeah. quiet i mean it's, it's an opportunity for us to kind of rediscover ourselves because we had them we were so young i mean I said I was 27. So, you know, I would, then I had to work my tail off just to afford everything. <laughs> right. We're in a, in a one income household, but yeah, now we can, we can maybe kind of rediscover ourselves a little bit and use that as an opportunity. Talk about reframing, um, you know, use that as an opportunity to discover ourselves. It's not easy though. Um, no, it, it isn't, but it's a great, it'll, it will be a great time in your marriage. Uh, when Susan and I experienced that when Stone left, um, I mean, our house changed the dynamic when Bo left, then when Bella left, and then when Stone left, and it was just the two of us, which is why we now spend our winters down in Naples, Florida. We kind of created an, another life down there and met all new friends, amazing people, and uh, compliment the amazing friends that we have at home and family uh, in Canton, Ohio. But, you know, we've, we're loving this stage of life right now and uh, loving the opportunity to go visit the kids all in Chicago. But we were never a dinner and a movie couple because with the boys sports and football, basketball and baseball and Bella as a competitive tennis player. I mean, we just we were never home. We were, you know, our friends were the people on the teams that we were with. And, yeah. and so it was so cool. We loved that time. Um, and it was over. We missed those games desperately. But, you know, now we, we've settled into a new routine. Um, this will be year five heading to Florida for the winter. And so, you know, we're, we're excited about that again. Yeah, very cool. Well, uh, to lighten the mood a little bit, um, I do have some uh, fun questions I ask everybody. And again, this is uh, in, in the spirit of getting to know my my guests a little bit more, starting off pop culturally. Um, what were some of your favorite TV shows when you were growing up, if you had any? Oh, as a kid, number one was Charlie's Angels. Um, oh, yeah. Huge Charlie's Angels fan, right? So in the 70s, I'm 55 now, um, but big, big Charlie's Angels fan. That was kind of a special show that my dad and I watched together. Love that. Yeah, I could probably three really good reasons why I watch that show. Exactly. And uh, I, I still uh, I, I still love those women today. I mean, they're um, those that are still alive. Um, amazing, beautiful. I just my, my wife knows that. It's a little soft, soft spot in my heart for those <laughs> angels. Did you watch um, the movies the, that they did um, with uh, Drew Barrymore and Cameron Diaz? And um, I think it was Lucy Liu. I think they were the, yeah, uh, the angels. I did. I watched them, enjoyed them. But again, uh, Farrah Fawcett, Kate Jackson, Jacqueline Smith. I mean, they, they were just icons to me. And so um, it never quite measured up, but I loved them because I love the spirit of bringing the franchise back. Yeah. Yeah. So Charlie's Angels, anything else you remember watching? So, um, you know, this is going to age me as a, as, as a kid, but certainly Brady Bunch and, you know, I Love Lucy, that was way into reruns, uh, you know, those I, I enjoyed. And then, um, you know, a little bit later, you know, I was a big Seinfeld fan, um, loved that. So love that humor. So my kid, two of my kids just got into Seinfeld and I was so happy. It's because so they they you know they'll binge it on netflix or whatever and and yeah, those episodes go by in like 22 minutes without commercials so they'll sit and watch three or four episodes and 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 i'll get to waste not waste time but i'll get to procrastinate yeah, that's right and, and watch uh, a few episodes of seinfeld the keith hernandez ones i mean that they, they forever will be burned in my mind um, so good so many great quotes from that show yeah agreed agreed uh, and the brady bunch i have to say comes up a lot on this show 
there's something about the Brady Bunch. People, um, you know, the authors I interview are always talking about the Brady Bunch. That's right. Um, how about musical artists? What did you like listening to growing up? Queen. Oh, Queen yeah. was was huge. Doobie Brothers. Um, I was always a fan of that. But Queen, matter of fact, I just watched a documentary on Sunday. Um, I, kind of the reboot with Adam Lambert um, joining Queen and touring. And I've watched Bohemian Rhapsody a couple of times. I uh, just love the Queen music. It was just, just so movie? unique and different. I, I love the movie. Um, I love the movie. I loved, because uh, I didn't really know the story. Of course, yeah. you know, years ago watching or listening to the music, but I love the variety in their music. I mean, the operatic tendencies to it, the rock, um, just the uniqueness of it. It just, it really inspired me. I loved it. I mean, just one of the top front men uh, ever, um, you know, Freddie Mercury. And yeah. I, I used to, I, I was a huge Queen fan in high school. I read everything I could read about the band. Um, and uh, I, I enjoyed the movie. I think the, the my favorite part was when Mike Myers showed up um, as, I think he was the producer or head of the record label or something. Right. And they, right. yeah, I didn't know it was Mike Myers, but they were pitching Bohemian Rhapsody to him. And I'm like, you know, the inside joke, of course, is, you know, he brought back Bohemian Rhapsody in Wayne's World, you know, and I'm like, oh, that was a really clever thing they did in that movie. Yeah, I'd love seeing the cycle of them come back and, and really the, the movie, you know, reintroduce them to young kids today. Yeah. Um, and so when we were when my kids were all in college and the boys were in the same fraternity and Bella Sorority hung out with them, you know, when they, they'd always have parties when we were there for Parents Weekend and have a date party. And mom and dad could go too. And when the Queen music would come on, you know, of course, the parents would just go crazy. But then it was awesome seeing all these young people, you know, going crazy. My wife and I met at a fraternity and sorority party. So we were like right back in our comfort zone. And, uh, you know, I love seeing the young people love that music. So it's, it's good to see their resurgence. Yeah. I have to ask, was the fraternity Kappa Sigma by any chance? Because that would be way too much of a coincidence. No, I okay. was an SAE. Okay, um, there you go. That would have been crazy. Yeah. That that there you go yeah um so you know Queen is uh, they're just they're just so good and Brian May's guitar I mean his his guitar tone is so unique uh, and he built his guitar with his dad um, I always thought that oh, was that's a cool, cool story and he was going to be I think an astrophysicist like he's a really bright guy um, like he is a rocket scientist I think <laughs> yeah know? he is um, how about this uh, I I do believe that uh, we all have inner children inside us and and, and inner child. Um, how, if at all, do you feed your inner child? You know, gosh, that is a really good question. I've never been asked that question before. Um, and I think I feed it every day because as a little kid, um, my dad would ask me, you know, Johnny, what do you want to be when you grow up? And my line that I, I apparently said all the time is I want to be a boss like you, dad. And, um, and then I you know, took over our family business at 24. My dad ended up getting cancer. And, and so, you know, I was running uh, that dealership. We were in the RV business. And then um, I sold uh, my dealership back in 2003 to Camping World and became on the executive team there and then was president and chief business development officer of our parent company, Camping World of Good Sam. And I retired when I was 50. And I got to be a boss of 10,000 plus people. And so, um, and, and still today in the various companies that I invest in or the boards that I serve on in private companies and public companies, you know, I get that opportunity to provide leadership. And so I don't like to think of myself as a boss. I'd rather think of myself as a leader. Um, and, and so as a little kid, I wanted to do that and I get to do that every day. And so I feel blessed about that. Yeah. Very cool. Um, uh, this next one will, uh, probably hit close to home given the topic of your book, but in what ways, um, if at all, do you view writing as a form of therapy? You know, um, I'm a believer in getting thoughts down on paper um, to free it from your mind so you can rest. I've had to use that with my anxiety, right? That, you know, I'm laying in bed and having these thoughts and, you know, you keep a notepad beside your bed so you can just jot them down so you don't have to keep reciting them, almost trying to commit them to memory for the next day or what I'm going to do with them. You know, for me, I think as I write the, as I wrote the book, and my wife would notice I would get quiet sometimes um, after having a, a writing period. And 
she would ask me what I was thinking. And, you know, I thought, you know, I feel like I am writing about a couple that I feel really close to and I really care about them. And then I keep having this reminder that it's actually us and that it is our story and we live through that. And honey, how did we do that? How, I mean, it was, that ride was so crazy and the ups and the downs and the hitting lows and then realizing that we weren't at our bottom and we were gonna go lower. So the writing for me crystallized that that couple um, did something special and that couple actually was us. So I, I got comfortable writing about them while realizing we were that couple. And yeah. so it really was therapeutic. And, um, and I love having it all chronicled today uh, for, for my kids, for, for them to know the story and, and for others as well. Yeah. Um, this is uh, your first book. Um, and uh, I don't know if it'll be your last, but what, um, what if any lessons about publishing did you learn the hard way going through this process? I had a great publisher, uh, Elite Online Publishing. They were great to work with. Um, so I think what I learned um, is, the, the and, and I'm a detail guy. I was an accounting major for undergrad and uh, grad school. I got, my dad picked my undergraduate degree, but then for grad school, I got to pick what I wanted to do. Um, and I, I, so I'm a detail guy, but you know, there, there were a ton of details in it. I do feel like I said, um, I feel qualified to parent now. I think I feel qualified to write a book now. Um, and so uh, I, I would like to, to go at it again. There's a lot of leadership principles and having the blessing of um, leading at an executive level, a company, you know, 4 billion in revenue and 10,000 plus employees. There's a lot I saw in leadership um, that worked and that didn't work. Um, the, the importance of realizing as a leader, if you want that title of supervisor or president or vice president or general manager, whatever your title is that you want, it, it can't just be about boosting your career. It needs to be a title that you recognize that you have influence over others' careers and their lives. And I want leaders to know um, the responsibility that they have to lift their employees up so that when they go home at the end of an eight or 10 hour shift and they take that energy home, it's bring good energy that they're having brought into their household and they're not exerting control um, in a negative way over their family. And, and in turn, to lift that family up so that they can send that employee back to work energized and ready to make a great positive contribution to the company. Because when you know we talk about leadership principles, Mike, it's not all to me about the idea of you know, this feel good environment just for the sake of feeling good. Corporately, we have a responsibility. We have a bottom line to honor. We have shareholders and stakeholders to honor. So we've got to do the job um, and, and be accountable. I just happen to believe that through the right leadership and holding people accountable in the right ways and respectful ways and creating a culture of lifting each other up, that it also serves the bottom line best. And uh, so it's a win-win in that scenario, win personally and win professionally. Yeah, there's there's so many uh, so many aspects to that, um, and uh, you hit the nail on the head. We need a book like that. So you get busy writing, Johnny. Start. Well, thank you. I <laughs> thank you. I you, maybe you're inspiring me here, Mike. You're <laughs> you're like my kids pushing me on the last one. There you go. And my last one, I, I call this my my Back to the Future question, which is, um, you know, if you could, if you could, if you had a time machine, and you could whisper some words of advice into um, the ear of your younger self, what would you tell a younger Johnny? Hmm. You know, that's a great question because I was asked that speaking in front of, of about four or 500 college seniors and a uh, young man asked me that same question. What do you wish you knew now um, when you were sitting in our seats? What do you wish you knew when you were sitting in our seats that would prepare you for the life you were going to live? And I said to him, um, the answer came to me quickly and I said it before thinking. I said, I wish I knew that life will be hard, but I'll be okay. And that's where the title of my book came from, because, you know, as a young guy, as I said earlier, you know, you just think you set goals, you reach them, you set the next goal and life just keeps going in that great tra trajectory. And you almost don't prepare yourself 
for those unexplained situations that happening that happen a child passing um an illness um you know adoption nightmares i mean all these things i never saw adoption in my future as a kid um and i'm so blessed that it happened and 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 to be able to realize that we were just meant to raise the kids that god sent us um and that creation of it what wasn't the lead story so you know i i, I wish i knew that uh life will be hard but i'll be okay well, there you go. A great, a great point to end on. Although I do uh, want to give you the opportunity to uh, let us know if you have a website or any social media handles. Uh, if people want to, to learn more about you, Johnny, uh, where can they go? Absolutely. So uh, my website is encourage33.com and uh, my Instagram at Johnny Serpilla. Uh, LinkedIn, I'm on there as well, Facebook also, but on my website, um, you know, see information about the book, the books available in a variety of places, Amazon, Barnes and Nobles, all those kind of places. Um, and all those are listed on the website as well, uh, with direct links. And then you'll see the the various companies that I'm involved in, and in the work that I do, that's um, been pretty exciting and impactful. And so for this second half of life uh, that I'm in, um, after uh, retiring five years ago, it's really been fun to, you know, see the people that God puts in my life and um, and the in the cool projects that I'm working on. I love it. And I'll be sure to put all of uh, those handles and addresses in the show notes. So those of you who are listening can just go to the show notes and uh, you don't have to write everything down right now. Um, Johnny, this has been a great conversation, a deep conversation. Um, and I wish you all the best with this book. Thank you, Mike. You as well. Um, and uh, keep being blessed with those triplets. Happy for you. <laughs> Thank you. Thanks for listening to Uncorking a Story. If you'd like more information about today's guest or to find out more about Mike, go to uncorkingastory.com. If you enjoyed the show, please subscribe, rate, and review us at Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Tune in every week to hear Mike Carlin uncork a new story.